This video discusses possible approaches to a problem that is not uncommon in my experience, and that is pain after arthroscopic shoulder surgery despite a preoperative interscalene or superior trunk block. A C56 brachial plexus block is widely viewed as the gold standard for regional analgesia after shoulder surgery. It's usually highly effective with patients experiencing little to no pain, and in fact, some shoulder surgeries can be done awake under these blocks alone. However, in my experience, it is not uncommon for patients to experience some intraoperative and postoperative pain despite an effective block. We'll look at reasons for this and regional anesthesia options to consider if supplemental opioids and other analgesics are not effective or feasible. The shoulder is a complex anatomical structure and its innervation is similarly complex. We often think solely in terms of the skin incision and the glenohumeral joint, but pain in the shoulder can arise from many different sources, not all of which are supplied by branches of the C56 roots of the brachial plexus. Pain after complex arthroscopic shoulder surgery is a good example. Skin incisions are minor, but these patients often arrive with chronic pain issues and underlying inflammatory injuries, and surgery itself involves debridement or trauma to many different tissues. In prolonged arthroscopic surgery, there is also often inevitable fluid extravasation into the soft tissues of the chest and shoulder, which can also cause acute discomfort. Let's look at a case to illustrate this. A patient with chronic shoulder pain, previous surgery, but fortunately not on chronic opioids, is scheduled for shoulder arthroscopy as a day surgery case. A preoperative superior trunk block is performed to provide intraoperative and postoperative analgesia. The surgery lasts one and a half hours. No defects requiring a surgical repair are found, but scar tissue in the subacromial space and around the rotator cuff is removed. Intraoperatively, the patient receives a low dose remifental infusion and following emergence receives two milligrams of intravenous morphine because of pain. In the postoperative care unit, the patient continues to have severe pain, rating it 8 out of 10 in severity. The nurses give a generous amount of opioid, but this has little effect, and they are concerned about giving more due to the patient's OSA and plan for discharge home at some point. They call you for help, knowing that you are a regional anesthesia enthusiast, to see what you can offer. On assessment, there is moderate swelling of the chest and shoulder from fluid, and the patient says that the pain is mainly in the posterior shoulder and also over the anterior aspect. Axillary pain is relatively minor. The first question is whether this represents a failed C5 to 6 block. However, on testing, the patient has cutaneous sensory loss in the expected distribution. So repeating the interscalene or superior trunk block is not going to help. It is likely that the pain is coming from the rotator cuff, despite the C5 to 6 root block, and is probably acute on chronic pain from the surgical debridement. As I've said, shoulder innervation is complex. Where there is posterior shoulder pain or pain in the chest and axilla, the rescue block that I usually perform first is a T2 or T3 ESP block. Its application to shoulder pain was first described by my friend Mauricio Ferrero in a remarkable case that we were reported in the Canadian Journal of Anesthesia. This short video shown here with the patient's permission illustrates the effect. It hurts. From 0 to 10, de 0 a 10, how is your pain usually when you are lifting your arm? When you start lifting your arm? 8 out of 10. Try to lift it more, please. Try to lift it more. Okay. Okay. Do your movement. Perfect. ¿Cómo está el dolor? Llegando un 5 por ciento. Casi nada. Almost zero, right? Yeah. Now I will note that I do not use it as the primary technique of choice for a perioperative analgesia. A C5 to 6 block still works better for this purpose. But as a rescue block after arthroscopic shoulder surgery, I have found that it works well for pain in the anterior chest, axilla, or in the posterior shoulder region. 
It can be performed even when there is fluid extravasation as the target area isn't usually involved. To perform the block, turn the patient lateral, keeping them semi-recumbent if that is more comfortable for them. As described in my thoracic epidural video, you can identify the T2 and T3 transverse processes by tracing back from the first rib in the supraclavicular fossa. They will be a lot higher up in the shoulder than you expect and often quite deep due to the bulk of the overlying trapezius muscle. A curved probe may sometimes provide a better view if it is very deep. This video illustrates this. The T2 rib and transverse process is identified with a traceback approach from the first rib. T3 is deeper because of the bulk of trapezius, so T2 is targeted in this case. I usually insert the needle in a caudal to cranial direction and inject 20 milliliters of 0.5% rupivacaine or similar long-acting local anesthetic. Pain relief is usually obtained in 5 to 10 minutes. This is what was done for this patient. The posterior pain disappeared, but she continued to complain of anterior pain. Further inquiry localized the pain to a very discrete area over the acromioclavicular joint. I have learned from colleagues who routinely do awake shoulder surgery that anesthetizing the supraclavicular nerves, which are the lower branches of the superficial cervical plexus, is essential to prevent intraoperative pain from the AC joint. It is therefore an appropriate block to perform if there is postoperative pain in this area and if it wasn't done preoperatively. Personally, I incorporate it into all my superior trunk blocks as described in my other video. The supraclavicular nerves are very easily blocked with a subcutaneous infiltration of 5 to 10 milliliters of local anesthetic over the middle scalene muscle at the level of the C5 to 6 roots of superior trunk. The nerves are often visible with careful tracing proximally and distally, but it's not essential to always identify them clearly. A 25 gauge hypodermic needle can be used, although in this example, a regular 22 gauge block needle is shown. This resolved the patient's pain completely, and she was discharged home two hours later without need for further IV or oral analgesia. Finally, if you consider that the initial preoperative C5-6 to block may not have worked as well as intended, apart from performing a repeat interscalene or superior trunk block, an option to consider is a sub suprascapular block. This has the advantage of reducing the risk of a significant phrenic nerve palsy or causing extensive motor block of the upper limb. The suprascapular nerve is easily identified by tracing the superior trunk from its origin. It is the most lateral and superficial round structure that separates from the superior trunk. And as you slide the probe distally towards the clavicle, it will travel laterally under the omohyoid muscle. The muscle is visible as a dark narrow band. Insert a needle lateral to medial to place the tip under the muscle and inject here. I find the nerve does not have to be specifically targeted, and in fact, I would rather stay a little bit away from it rather than be too close to avoid any mechanical injury. Five to 10 milliliters of local anesthetic will spread under the muscle and anesthetize the nerve.
Thanks for watching. Feel free to check out the more detailed videos related to this topic available on the channel.